Thank you, Nancy. First of all, uh, again, as a member of the board of the AP76 Foundation, I want to thank you all for coming to this um, accessory conference here. And I particularly want to uh, thank our special donors who really, truly made this possible. Uh, this is not a self-supporting kind of uh, conference, and I really appreciate that. And I think it was a very uh, attractive addition to the main conference. And uh, hopefully we can continue to support this kind of uh, translational interaction. And based on that, I in fact decided to uh, proceed with being somewhat inspirational and provocative in my brief presentation here in attempting to put together some, uh, some clinical information that I think bridges very nicely all the basic science that we heard on HHB 6-7 in the first two days together with the sort of clinical frustration yet hopefulness that we see as we look at genomics and uh, gene expression arrays, et cetera, and how that might translate to more effective treatment for these patients. So if we work from a hypothesis that there's a subgroup of patients with CFS, uh, their symptoms may be the result of an ongoing viral replication and immune dysregulation, produced perhaps by an interplay of a variety of viruses, then as a clinician, the obvious conclusion is that you might be able to influence this process with an antiviral. And how do we find these patients is always what I'm asked when I'm addressing this. And I chose to, to present to you a technique that I use to identify patients with severely uh, disabling disease that <clears throat> appears to be related to reactivation of HHV6 simply as an example of a clinical protocol I've developed. And these patients in general presented with predominant CNS symptoms including headaches, neurocognitive impairments, paresthesias, and autonomic dysfunction. And this is again gleaned from the world of CFS patients that meet the criteria. They all had abnormal MRI scans with the T2 weighted images over time. At least they all had at least two MRIs. They all had spec scans, which Tony has told us about the findings there, that were abnormal with regional hypoperfusion. And they all had spinal taps. And interestingly, you'll find that <clears throat> the patients who were subsequently noted to have HHV6 infection in the spinal cord did not have a legal clonal banding, and we heard about that yesterday. They did have an increase in total protein, an increase in myelin basic protein, increase in lactic acid, increase in lymphocytosis, and an increased opening pressure. So there was a characteristic pattern on spinal taps that was, used, was entrance criteria into this. And the viruses, and this number has increased markedly since the last time I provoked people with this presentation, is that 49 of the 279, or 16%, were positive for virus in the spinal fluid by PCR. And there, again, there was one with EB, one with CMV, and 42 with HHV6. And interestingly, these all subtyped as variant A. And of our available drug treatments, you've heard about most of these, so there's only one left to talk about on here. Foscarnet was rejected because it's very difficult for these patients to take. It's complicated and fraught with significant side effects. <clears throat> Balsite we've already heard about, uh, gangcyclovir I used early on and there are various problems with gangcyclovir. We know to reject acyclovir for HHV6. Valtrex is no reason to suspect would be effective in this uh, situation and, and Ampligen, uh, Dr. Demiriez reviewed that. So I chose to use sidofovir in these patients or this type and that was based on the um, elegant work that you saw yesterday indicating that it's perhaps the most effective anti-HHV6 drug that's available. Secondly, it's intravenous, and I could control blood levels and, uh, and compliance in this particularly ill group of patients. 